Growing up in the shadow of Washington National Cathedral, Thomas Sayers' early art education and his love and respect of natural materials came from the stonecutters, masons, and artists at the cathedral. His education continued at St. Albans School, University of North Carolina, with a Moorhead Scholarship, University of Michigan, and Cranbrook Academy of Art. Thomas is one of the founding principals of Clearscapes, a multi multidisciplinary design firm here in Raleigh. Um, while producing studio pieces, most of his efforts are focused in the public arena. His commissions extend from Canada, Istanbul, Hong Kong, Thailand, and all across the U.S., including San Jose, Chuxin, Denver, Nashville, Portland, Washington, D.C., and of course here in Raleigh. So please join me in welcoming Thomas Sayer. Well, thanks for being here. I, I was wondering whether anybody would show up, and, and wow, this is a great crowd. So thanks for being creative here this morning. I mean, it's a creative act to show up, I think. Um, so I'm not going to just drag you through a zillion projects. I, I um, took the title seriously and the little thing on your name tag. So, you know, where does this thing called creativity come from? And and so. I, I took that challenge in my world and what I do, where does it come from? And I'm going to try out uh, some ideas on you um, via three projects, but only three. Um, and then I hope we can have a little bit of a conversation afterwards. So um, where creativity isn't for me is the sort of 19th century view. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use perhaps irresponsibly, the word, interchange the word creative and art. They are not the same thing, but they are obviously related. So forgive me, but I will just seamlessly slip between the two. And that may be a, a point of discussion afterwards. What is the difference? In most of our Western view of artists are that they are on the edge of our society or culture. They are magical people. They do the thing, the creative, the art. And we marvel at them and hold them in esteem, although we sort of deprecate them at the same time, interestingly. And it takes Theo, um, Van Gogh's brother, and then I think her name, his wife's name was Annette, I think. And it took them to, to protect in the myth uh, Van Gogh and, and spirit his work away and save it and sell it and write books about it and create the image. Um, here we have the master of, of using that myth of the magical artist that contains all the creativity. Um, this is really bit mappy, I'm sorry, but, but he's holding this weird looking cat which is which is significant. It's, it's artist as noble savage, as, as sort of um, in touch with the jungle and the, and the primitive and the secret and in and, and touch with a, a kind of voltage that few of us can take. The problem with this myth is it's they're the creative folks and we, the rest of us, are somehow not. And I think that is just flat out wrong. Uh, all of us are creative, and I don't mean that in a, some sort of touchy-feely, ultra-democracy sense, but, but I, I know for my own self. Um, so here's the, here's the new theory. This is creativity as fracking. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that creativity, and how I work, and I'll try to demonstrate this, lives in all these little pockets that are not all inside of me by any means. They are out there in these interesting and unlikely pockets. So let me try to demonstrate. So here's coming out of the same sort of 19th century thing, the artist's sketchbook, right? And artists sort of muse along. And, 
And this is my sketchbook, and I, I was interested in doing an earth casting that, uh, and I'll show you what that means, that when you stand it up, there was a, a window or a port mm -hmm. in the air up above. And so that was sort of the one. Um, I've actually since built something a lot like that. Um, and then there's the artist model made by the artist. All this is sort of following the Van Gogh model until you think about 30 feet tall. And that's what that dimension is. And this is starting to intersect with one of the pockets called structural engineering. And this, this was drawn or, or engineered collaboratively between me and Christian Carco, some of you know him, and Chuck Lysett, who has one of those magic seals you can put on to, to attest that when the 90 mile an hour hurricane blows at this 30 foot high thing, it won't fall over and kill somebody. And that's what that seal means. So that's a back and a forth. And, and that's, no, Chuck, we can't, we can't make this really thick column because that kills the idea. And so it's a negotiation back and forth. Notice the mud on this drawing. That's because this drawing is a real drawing. It was on the hood of the truck. And the muddy hands <laughs> held it. So this is real stuff. How do you make a 30-foot high earth testing stand up? So another pocket is the wonderful folks, um, some of whom I work with for a long time, uh, and some of whom are sort of hired labor. Um, here is uh, Daniel Kelly, who I worked, had the great privilege of working with for six years or so. He's now in New Orleans as an artist. And he is digging the first shovel uh, along the drawing uh, of this piece. And his hand, and how, and how he digs, and everything, every mark he makes and everybody else makes becomes part of the art. And so that's another, in his body lives another um, fracking uh, little pod or, or reservoir of creativity that becomes part of the work. Um, we also use backhoes. Um, enter the infamous Ricky Pierce, complete with fedora. Um, <laughs> His bejeweled hands <laughs> are operating mostly two switches that have 14 micro switches. And making a backhoe, which goes in one direction, do a curvilinear thing, a spherical thing, is very difficult. I've been working with him for 15 or 18 years, and um, he likes and looks forward to flying all over the country where we have the right backhoe waiting. And so I have to say this is a, a fairly big uh, reservoir of creativity that lives in those hands. Somehow he's able to manipulate them despite all the gold on them. <laughs> so we then dig a hole, um, two holes, remember it was two pieces, and we put the steel, remember the, the drawing from Chuck Lysett? There's the steel, oops. Um, there's the other form. Uh, you will see these little magical embeds that come from tilt up uh, construction work from architecture. Often warehouses are made by casting big slabs in the parking lot, build the parking lot first, and then tilt up these big slabs and hook them to a steel frame. So I've, I s have stolen that technology uh, to uh, make art, uh, and that's, that's arguably a whole other little reservoir that those that engineer these cool little things, you'll see how they work. Um, here is the footing that these two pieces will ultimately sit on. We then uh, tint the concrete in a concrete truck. Uh, this was three trucks with 10 yards each. That's a lot of concrete with iron oxide, so it, it's the same color as the dirt. We then tap into yet another <coughs> reservoir, in this case, swimming pool makers. So this is so-called shotcrete. And this guy, um, so his first response was, so, so we're making this weird shaped swimming pool in the ground like we usually do, but then we're gonna pick it up and not swim in it. Is that kind of the deal? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, you got it. And he said, well, that's cool. <laughs> So here he is with this very heavy pipe uh, hose full of, of concrete, 
and he's spraying it at high velocity at our mold. And there's Christian, um, who, who is in the fray, and he's saying, that's enough thickness. Every, it, it, one, two or three seconds more of concrete adds a half inch, which is another, if you multiply it all out, five or six or 8,000 pounds in this thing that needs to weigh no more than, and you'll see why, it needs to weigh no more than 40,000 pounds each. Any more than that, we're in trouble. So he is, he is sort of like um, director cameraman, which is kind of the backhoe relationship, director Ricky Pierce cameraman. It's that kind of relationship. And it's dangerous, and it's loud, and it's really violent, this stuff coming out at high velocity. Um, oops. Okay, so then we trowel it up on the, so this, that's the top of the mold I'm reaching over, and the idea is you can't really tell the difference between this kind of dirt called concrete and the real dirt. I mean, concrete is a kind of dirt. It's, it's, it's uh, rocks and sand and cement tinted with iron oxide, the same stuff that colors our wonderful red dirt around here. We then wait 28 days minimum concrete accrues 90 some percent of its strength in 28 days, which is strong enough. And we dig around it like a pan coming out of uh, like a, 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 a pie. You have to get out of its pan. And with the backhoe and by hand, we then hook these shackles to the aforementioned lift embeds, those kind of curly cute things. And we're now waiting for the crane to come in to pick this up. And preceded by a little interview with the crane man, another little fractal pocket, right? Um, and he is like the swimming pool guy, but with more skepticism. He's saying, okay, so we're going to now take this thing that's, that's really in the ground, down <laughs> seven feet, and we're going to pick it up and rotate it against the sky. So out of Mother Earth comes Father Sky vertical. And he's not really wild about this idea the first time <laughs> he saw this. I've now, since this time, I've worked with him and his company many, many times. And they, like the swimming pool guys, kind of think it's cool. It's, not the, it's, it's a little more challenging and fun than putting air conditioning units up on top of big buildings, which is a lot of what they do. He has skill that I don't have in how to manipulate 40,000 pounds from a single cable. And his expertise, so there's a kind of ministry here from skepticism, like why the hell are we doing this, to, yeah, you got any more gigs? These are, these are cool. And they lose money doing it. Nobody makes, you know, it's, it's, it's cheaper. It, you make more money putting HVAC stuff on top of roofs. So, in comes the crane. Oops, nobody said, oh, by the way, there's a really soft spot in this field. And so the 90,000 pound crane just sank in the first 10 minutes. Uh, and so he's calling his boss on a cell phone and I'm calling the tow truck on a cell phone. And then, wait, it jumps the head. Okay, so here comes the very expensive tow truck. We're not talking about the little wimpy one for cars. This is the big, <coughs> huge one that literally yanks this 90,000 pound crane out. We then start over again, but with the, the um, oak um, temporary road. So a whole other two semi trucks full of this stuff, which weigh a couple thousand pounds each. And the crane makes his own road in because of the, oops, we forgot to mention soft spot right there. So now, after a very expensive, long, long morning, the crane is now hooked up, and there is 40,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds of, of oomph up on each of these shackles, and nothing is happening. So picture veins popping, doing a curl, and veins popping out like that. That's what the crane is doing. And so now, <laughs> we have, the depressed artist <laughs> with a kind of, so now what do we do? And this guy, 
this wonderful guy who's the lowest man on the totem pole. He's not the operator driving the $3 million crane. He's the rigger. And the rigger says, you know, why don't we pull gas tanks out of the ground? Sometimes you have to ooch them a little bit. I said, you have to do what? <laughs> he said, ooch. He said, you know that back over there that was left by Ricky, the key is in it, he had seen. He said, why don't we just ooch it a little bit? <laughs> so, there is the ooch. And so we got the backhoe out and we're, we're digging down so we're not hitting the surface. And it didn't take much. Now, so what we're looking for is a crack forming as the piece separates from its mold, from the earth. And voila, with the ooch, we get the crack and then up out of the ground. And then we temporarily park it here so we can find the external uh, embeds. And then we lift it up and come down into the footing and get it right and then brace it off. I want you to know this guy holding his kid, this is a, a long lens, he is not in the path of this thing. <laughs> okay, it looks like he's right there. Oh, lady, look at this kid. <laughs> um, he's not. Um, so we then brace it off uh, with these telescoping braces and then do the other one and just like the model, <laughs> except not, because only when the sun breaks across this thing can we then see, and, and so the environment is a whole other little reservoir of the creative, because uh, what better light is there than the sun and the changing of the seasons and the changing of the sky to make this thing uh, do what it does, which is be an evidence of a wonderful balance between human-made and nature-made. You can't tell the difference where one ends and the other begins. You can't tell where that line is. There's dirt still on this and there's concrete. This is a mark where a, a rebar scraped across the, the earth mold as a depression is now a protrusion. It, it, that's not a piece of rebar, that's, a, that's a, a part of the casting. What these are in many ways all about is striking that relationship, which uh, is a kind of co-collaboration with nature. <coughs> and I might posit in a sort of political way that we damn well as a culture ought to get better at that balance than historically we have been. So there is a bit of a, a message, uh, if you will, to these. And then this wonderful um, crack, fractal crack through it that you can walk into and, aha, what I really wanted was the view of the sky through this thing. Um, there's another part of all this and that might be called home. <coughs> and I'm not going to say a whole lot about home, um, but other than these are the babes that I live with. <laughs> um, home works something like this. If you're going to the studio to do the real stuff, to be up against the it, the creative edge, Come home anytime. If, on the other hand, you're going to do emails and surf the net and do BS, then you damn well better take the trash out that you didn't take out yesterday. That's kind of how it works. And that is an invaluable pocket uh, where my creativity uh, lives. Project number two. Uh, uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand, up in the north, it looks like Vietnam. This is on the edge of a very interesting uh, boarding school, basically, uh, in a valley with an old rice field. And I was uh, asked to do a piece at this school. Haven't done the piece yet, interestingly, but I have faith that someday I will. I was instead, well, I got there, but 
I was told to uh, meet my client, uh, whose name is Tree. Um, you will come to Phuket first, which is way in the south, and tropical and fabulous. What a pad he has. And we swam every day in this pool that he built uh, that, that, ha that goes off to a zero edge. And it, basically, he just pumps seawater up, and there's a waterfall. We, you swim in a tank, and then it falls back into the sea. And while swimming one day, I was there for five, right down below and kind of around the corner is a cove in Phuket. Uh, and he was the first developer to develop. He did the Club Med, of all things, in this cove in Phuket. Uh, owned a lot of land and uh, had tents. He used to camp out 30 years ago. Well, Phuket, if anybody's been there, I mean, it is the, especially European, resort to go to, and it's all very fabulous. <laughs> and he, one day, looked down and saw this really lousy sort of motel-like thing. And he felt, I mean, he got very quiet and he said, I'm, I'm responsible for this bad hotel. It wasn't one he did, but I, you know, I opened the gate of development in Phuket. And right then, this butterfly landed on his hand. And he said, what have I done to the butterflies? With tears in his eyes. And the, that night, he said, I'm building this uh, part, another part of the, this hotel that's right there. And there's a need for a water tower. And what can you do to mask this water tower? And so I made this model uh, here in Raleigh. And the idea, and on the way back, I was reading the guidebook to Phuket. And I realized that one of the restaurants he owns had the largest uh, red wine collection in all of Thailand, which is 60 million people, which is a lot of wine. So I realized he had a lot of wine bottles. And so this is a complicated story, but what eventually happened was somehow the water tower that this was supposed to mask went away. The need for the water got buried underground in a cistern or something. But the peace persisted. And it it became this bug house for the butterflies. In the tropics, if you have a void of any kind, especially in the shade, bugs move in. And so we eventually designed this thing, which I would have had um, earth cast circles of descending diameters and stacked them up with a big crane. But in Thailand, the king has said, the beloved king said, we need to build based on our own technology. And they have cranes, yes, but they don't have a lot of them, especially in Phuket. And, but they have a lot of labor, especially Burmese labor. So the, the, the impetus of the water tower that was inside this, uh, hiding it, um, went away. And, and it became a beacon for cars and boats to find the place. But more important to Tree, my client, who paid for this, is that it was a kind of subversive place for the bugs to go. The bugs that he wept over when the, when the uh, butterfly landed on his hand. So then we had to figure out, how are we doing here? Yeah, we're okay. Uh, how to make a house for bugs and back and forth between Raleigh and Phuket with these wonderful workers. Um, and we had to figure out how to earth cast lots of blocks with bottles in them, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, they sent an emissary over here, a, a young architect, and, well, just one guy. And he, he was the sort of translator between the labor force. And then uh, I went twice, once with Jed. Um, this is, uh, so there it goes. These are the base blocks. And so there's this whole village of Burmese people who are working on this hotel. And they much preferred to work on this, which they got the idea that this, what, nobody's making any money off of this. This was for the butterflies. This is for the Buddha. And they had reverence and respect for that and, and put so much of themselves into it in terms of detailing how to do it, 
and, and just their magnificent effort to take these 400 pound blocks, can't use cranes, right? The king said don't use a crane, and I schlep them up to uh, the whole piece is almost 50 feet um, on bamboo scaffolding. So the spirit of these people, in my view, got into all this material um, in, in a way that, that was, since I wasn't there every day, when I'd show up, I could just see it and feel it. And I'll for, I am forever grateful to these wonderful people who uh, may be able to go back to their, uh, their own country of Burma. Um, I, I hope they can. Sometimes it takes a while. So this is uh, the piece from the road. Um, here are the 4,000 wine bottle bases, or ends, bottoms. And here are all the, this, so this is a big motel for bugs um, who, who will and have invaded these little cavities and set up residence. And then looking through to the sky, this is not from the ocean, it's farther, but you can see it from boats, these wonderful boats that come up and down the coast and from the road. So it's, the, it's like a lighthouse uh, for this place. Okay, last project. Um, this is quicker. So this is a, a memorial, a veterans and memorial in, of all places, Garner, North Carolina. Now, memorials for police, fire, and veterans are, are some of the most notoriously treacherous projects one can do. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, there's all kinds of criteria of names and decades of conflict and telling the whole st story of American <coughs> warfare was part of this. And we at Clearscape submitted to a competition that cost us a fortune for this little teeny project. But we just wanted to do it as a group. And, and we defined the backs that hold these um, uh, uh, granite carved panels. So you walk down the slot, this is the back, these are the fronts of the other tier. We rendered them as being earth castings, right? I mean, that's part of what we do. And budget crunch, sort of king tankerous board, and blah, blah, blah. Last week, it came down to you got to cast them in two days for fixed budget in Charlotte at this precast place. And how are we going to get the spirit of these surfaces? How are we going to achieve that for no pay? It came down to that. And we could have said, OK, do some <coughs> BS you know, precast surface. There's architects out there. You know what I'm talking about. Or, and so there's a little close up. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but how to do that surface was the key. So I get up at 5 in the morning and go to Charlotte, um, and I find all these molds. This is about a third, so these are big, with a little bit of dirt in the bottom, like that much, which if they had cast that, it would have been pretty boring. And so in a matter of you know, an hour or two, we have to figure out how to make, how to create a, a cast <coughs> surface uh, that's, that's as alive as when we dig them in, in the ground, for real. And through 10 guys who had never done anything like this before, um, all right, so we get dirt, and then we, get, we rent this jumping jack, and we figure out that if we make a dome that's thicker here than here, we can create, we can make clods of dirt where these are thinner, these are thicker, but these fall apart in, a, in an interesting way. And we, we were able to manufacture very quickly a repertoire of clods to then place and make a decent and interesting surface. So here we are moving them. Uh, we had to have some custom skinny ones. So Juan is making these little teeny squished ones. And we then placed them and, and um, really um, what these guys couldn't do was do the placement. And so he helped schlep the, the big pieces 
uh, and then I had to, by hand, every square foot, compose this random surface. Uh, and, and, and we were able to get that in two days, um, times 30 of these. Um, the point here is that under duress, um, by sort of huddling with these mostly Spanish-speaking laborers, who had never done anything, and it's like dirt. Why we, we, we're supposed to? Our job is usually to cast as smooth and neutral a panel as you can possibly get, and we get beat up when there's little blemishes. We want like oh, oh, super blemish. <laughs> this is the opposite of what they are trained and beat on every day to do. And to unleash that spirit, and and these guys work 13 hours a day. Um, and agreed to not work for overtime because they were interested. Because they thought this is, they want to they see what the result will be, which none of us have seen yet. But they're starting to come out soon. Um, so then the steel, and then this, these overhead cranes, boy, I wish I had some of those. I mean, 5,000 pounds of concrete, right in the right place. And um, screed. And then these are how we lift them up. And done, but not done, we'll see how they look. So while I was on my knees, I thought of one of my favorite Genesis stories of Jacob wrestling with the angel. You may recall the story. Right across the Jabbok River is, is uh, Esau, Jacob's brother, who had every reason to be really pissed off at Jacob. And he had a big army, so Jacob's by himself, and the angel comes and picks a fight with him and won't let him go. And in fact, the angel says, Jacob, I've had enough. And Jacob says, not until you bless me. So I felt on my knees last week, I really need a blessing here, because this is painful. And so I'm hoping we'll have a blessing that will come. Um, last slide. Um, second to last slide, a whole other reservoir, and this isn't a little um, fracking pocket, there's a major reservoir of creativity that lives in the users or consumers or audience, whatever word you want to use, who come to the work like this guy on his own. There's, this guy is, uh, there's a zillion pictures by this guy on the internet, and he sneaks out at night and and, and make stuff with the existing light with a camera. Um, and I think it's fabulous. And this happens all the time with most of our works, not just mine, but your work too. <coughs> These guys complete the circle and add their own fractal, fracking pocket of creativity to the mix, without which it'd be a whole lot more boring. So this is not how I work. The, 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 um, the image, the um, persona of this is very different from where I find creativity. And I hope that you all will think about where you find yours, because I know it's in there. Thank you.